All right, good morning, everyone. As you know, we've been going through our Acts series. We went through Acts chapter 1 last week, and this week we're Acts chapter 2. And it's interesting because that's the one chapter that I could probably ask about everybody in here, and they would know what Acts 2 is about, right? It's the outpouring of the Spirit, day of Pentecost. I might ask you about what's in Acts 15, and you may not know, Council of Jerusalem, or 5, Ananias and Sapphira. But Acts 2, almost everyone knows, right? So I decided to kind of approach this a little differently. Uh, and I'm going to use a lot of the Old Testament because I want us to go back and look to see how it's a fulfillment of Scripture. Now, normally how we would do that, we would go to Jeremiah and Ezekiel, which we're not going to do. But there's different passages in there that talk about that in the last days the Lord would pour out his spirit, that he would bring forth a new covenant, that he would place uh, the law in men's hearts, that they wouldn't have to teach each other because they would all know the Lord. So we have those scriptures that we normally use to kind of see as fulfillment of Acts chapter 2. But I'm going to go back farther, okay? Farther than that, we're going to go back to actually Genesis, very first book, right? Genesis chapter 10. And I'm not going to read out of 10, but I'm going to start actually reading some out of chapter 11. But in Genesis chapter 10, that is the, the table of nations. So you usually have a headline in your Bible, and right under that, it lists these nations, the 70 nations that were known at that time. And that is why when Jesus sent out the 12 two by two, then he sent out the 70 two by two. That was a symbolizing of taking back those 70 nations, okay? Which, again, was the known world at that time. And it was also why Paul, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, was so adamant about trying to get to Spain. Because Spain was the furthest point of those seven nations, the, fur the furthest west, okay? So he had that desire, and we don't know for sure if he made it or not. His desire was to go to Spain, to preach the word there, because that would fulfill his ministry of going to those 70 nations that were known in, in chapter 10 of the book of Genesis. Now, what we're going to look at is in chapter 11 of Genesis, we're going to look at verses 6 through 9. And this is the story of the, you know, the Tower of Babel. And you kind of all know what happened there. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and read verse 1. It says, now the whole world had one language and common speech. So they all had one language. Everybody spoke the same thing. Okay. And then, as we look down in, in verses 6 through 9, it says, I'll go back to 5 actually, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. <clears throat> so they were basically building a ziggurat, which was going to be for worship, not the worship of Yahweh, but their own gods. And the Lord said, if one people speaking the same language and they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. This is why it is called Babel, because the whole look because they were, because there the Lord confused the languages of the whole world, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face 
of the earth. So the Lord gives them, divides their language, separates these languages, okay? And so they ended up scattering because each one couldn't understand what the other were doing, so they went by groups inhabiting different parts of the land. And so what we see, a couple things, it says, come let us go down. All right? So the Lord is using his divine counsel, and it's not just the Lord coming down. He's bringing some of his divine counsel, which is made up of a lot of different things. We usually think of angels, but there's seraphim, there's archangels, there's what Daniel calls the watchers, and the book of Enoch calls the watchers. And so we have this heavenly host that he actually consults. Now, the Lord doesn't need them, but he chooses to work through other supernatural beings. Just like he doesn't need us, but he chooses to use humans, you know, jars of clay, to fulfill his will and his purposes. But when we got to, to Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we see a reversal of this. While they were separated through the gift that was given and the outpouring of the Spirit, each of them, remember, heard their language in their own native tongue. So in, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. The last book of the Pentateuch. And this is what basically is known as the Divine Council passage. And as you go through 32, this is the Song of Moses, and he's been basically given the history of the people of Israel. Okay? But when we come down to verses 8 and 9, he says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, now when did he divide all mankind? Back in Genesis chapter 11, right? By dispersing their languages. It says, He set boundaries for the people. Now according to the number of the sons of God, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, or Israel, is his allotted inheritance. Now, in many of your Bibles, it may say, according to the number of the sons of Israel. That's a mistranslation. Like I'm reading out of the NIV, and that's wrong. It should say, sons of God. So you really need to mark out and put sons of God, because that is the right interpretation. And like the ESV, English Standard Version, it has a correct interpretation of that. Why did they do that? Because they didn't know what to do, was talking about other gods. So when you think about sons of God, just think of the supernatural, other supernatural beings, like angels, archangels, seraphim, watchers, all the different categories, all different hierarchies. Like an angel is a job description. Angel means a messenger. Okay? And so there's this hierarchy, and the Lord has a council, again, that he uh, bounces things off, uses them to fulfill his will. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. But the Israel, or Jacob, it says, and of course Jacob's name was, was changed to Israel, and, uh, was his portion. Okay, so he took this portion of people, starting with Abraham and began to work down the line. And in the one sense, you could say they were the elect, but they weren't elected salvation. They were elected to receive the ordinances of God, the Mosaic Covenant, all the stuff that went with that, the temple ordinances, uh, the tabernacle, all that stuff, okay? Unfortunately, many of them apostated. They went and served other gods. And as a result of that, then an exile came later. 
But I want to give you an example. Turn over to uh, 1 Kings chapter 22. It's one of my favorite prophets by the name of Micaiah. 1 Kings back 22. And we're going to start looking at verse 32. But before that, I'll, I'll kind of give you the story. In fact, I had asked both my sons to name one of their kids Micaiah. Because I just, I, I thought he's an awesome guy. He's, he's a trash-talking prophet. Okay? He's uh, really cool. And what's happening here is, if you need to go back and read the whole chapter, but, but Ahab is the king of Israel. Okay? And Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. So he's down in Judah, the southern kingdom. Israel's the northern kingdom. Ahab's a bad dude. You all remember that. So he wants to go. So he's got Jehoshaphat with him, and he wants them to go to war with him to take back Ramah Gilead. And so he calls his 40 prophets, and they all prophesy the same thing. Basically saying, yes, go. you be successful. You're going to kick butt, basically. Okay? You're going to take back, and you're going to, going to be great. And so Jehoshaphat kind of said, well, is not, not a prophet of the Lord here? And then uh, Ahab says, well, yeah, there's one guy, Micaiah, but he always prophesies something bad. I don't like that dude, you know. But, well, can't we hear him, you know? So he calls Micaiah. And they tell Micaiah, hey, you got 400 prophets, and they all prophesied that it's going to go well, it's going to be great, they're going to take it back, going to kick butt, okay? So Micaiah tells him, well, I can only tell you what the Lord has told me. So he goes, and at first he says, okay, Ahab asked him, okay, should we do this? And he says, uh... Yeah, just go. You're gonna, it's going to be great. It's going to be, you're going to win. You're going to, you know, it's going to be awesome. But he says it very sarcastically. And they know he's saying it sarcastically. And then King Ahab says, I told you never to lie in the name of the Lord. Tell me what he said. So I said, okay. So we're going to pick up the story there, okay, in, um, in verse 19. Let me find it here. So Mike, Micaiah continued, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the hosts of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there. Now one suggested this and another that. And finally a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked. I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed and entice him, says the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed, decreed disaster for you. So he gives him the word of the Lord. And of course, they're very upset about that. Lock him up. And, but his word is true. And that's ended up being what happened. But what I want you to see is he has this heavenly host that around him, and he's asking, the Lord's asking, okay, what do you think, gang? What's the best strategy here? And then his spirit gives him this idea, says, hey, I can do that. Go do it. And he did it. Again, the Lord doesn't need us. He doesn't need his heavenly beings. He's completing himself, but he chooses to use other vessels, supernatural vessels, and us human people for his purposes. So that's, you see the divine counsel at work, just as he desires, again, to work with us as humans. 
Now, another example, just turn over to Job, right before you get to Psalms, go look at Job chapter 1. Job's always a good book, like if you think you're just in too good a mood, read it to kind of bring you back down. That Ecclesiastic, that's always another good one, you know, so, well, I'm feeling a little too high today, so I'm going to read a class Ecclesiastic. But anyway, so Job chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? So see, these are all gathering together. They're coming for that purpose. They're they're having that divine counsel. There's another one in Job Job 38 and verses 5 through 7. It says, whom he, so this is the Lord talking to to Job after, towards the end of this whole story, okay? He says, tell me if you understand, who marked off its dimension? Surely you know who stretched a measuring line across it. On what were its footings set, or who laid the cornerstone, while the morning stars sang together? And all his angels shouted for joy. Now, again, that should be a place where it should say sons of God rather than angels. So we have several different instances where when they transcribed it, they didn't know quite how to handle that. And so in one case, it was sons of Israel. In this case, they, they used angels. They felt safe in that. But it's really sons of God. Think of sons of God, little g, okay? There's only one most high. Now, another one is Psalms 82. Now, this is a a psalm about the divine counsel and about judgment. If you read the book of, of Enoch, now, Enoch is not in, it is in some Bibles, it's in Ethiopian Bibles and some others. It's quoted in the New Testament. But we don't consider it canon. But it's in Enoch that we have a lot more information about the sons of God and watchers, as, as Daniel uses that phrase, the watchers, who were put in charge of these nations. But in verse, we'll read the whole passage here, because this is about uh, the judgment that was going to come on these, on these sons of God who he put in charge of these other nations who were supposed to uh, rule them righteously, but they did not. Instead of each of them tried to receive the worship themselves, lead them away from the Lord. In verse 1, it says, God presided in the great assembly. He gave judgments among the gods. Again, little chi. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality in the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless? Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed? Rescue the weak and the needy? Deliver them from the hand of the wicked? They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Verse 6, I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere men. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the inheritance are your inheritance. All the nations are your inheritance. So we see that what the Lord has given over, he's now about to reclaim that the full earth, that all the earth is his. Now 
And there's another one in, eight, in Psalms 89, verses 5 through 7, where it's talking about the divine counsel again. But we'll skip that because I realize that the chiefs come on at 12. So we'll go on to Acts chapter 2 now. <clears throat> so Acts chapter 2. If I can find it with one hand. All right. So we're going to kind of just go through this, breaking it down. But keep in mind all those, those things we've, we've already talked about, okay? Because this is a fulfillment of a lot of those things that happen in clear back in Genesis, okay? It's about taking back the world. It is God's kingdom. And so he's going to begin to, uh, to draw them back. And, they, and you can you know, put pieces together with like Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God went into, you know, the, uh, into the women and produced giants and, and how that falls in with Peter and others, how you know, they were put in, in chains of darkness and held in captivity these watchers, but anyway, that's, that's be for another day. It all ties in, just put it that way. So Acts chapter 2, and 1 through 4, we'll start with. So when the day of Pentecost, again, 50 days from the Passover to Pentecost, so Jesus was, was crucified, he was in the grave, for partial three days, so somewhere around between seven, eight days uh, after Jesus leaves, because he was there for 40 days, talking and, you know, teaching them, showing up here and there, disappearing here and there, walking through closed doors, you know, all that stuff. And so as they're in this room, and he told them, you know, stay there, most likely, there's 120 in the room praying. It says they were praying constantly. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Now, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, that tongues is a little different application than we see like in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, because in this case, those languages that they spoke were all languages of the Jews that have come from all over the world to celebrate Pentecost. So, what had happened is, if you go back through the history, think of it this way. So, in 722 B.C., the, the northern nation of Israel is taken captivity, and they're, they're scattered to the wind. The southern nation, Judah, they lasted about 120-some years because they were taken, destroyed in 586 B.C., and they were scattered to the nations. So, they were scattered. But think of it this way, the Lord seeded, put seed in all these nations, what were known as the 70 nations, God had moved people there, not by choice, but they're there, okay? Because the people who are coming back are faithful Jews. They wouldn't be making that trip to come all the way back to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost unless they were serious, Okay? So it's all just a coincidence that, there, that the Lord pours out his spirit on the day of Pentecost and they just all happen to be there, right? Right. So, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it talks about, for everyone who speaks in tongue does not speak to man, but to God. Because no one understands him, he utters m mysteries with his spirit. So that's why I say this is a little different application. And Paul says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. Speak in the tongues of men and angels. 
okay? And the very last word we have on tongues is verse 39 of chapter 14, where it says, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. And yet we find many churches today, you better not be speaking in tongues, all right? And yet that is the last word, do not forbid speaking in tongues. What's so hard about that to understand? I mean, I'm pretty clear to me. And you know, I, I think of our, our testimony, I've kind of shared before that uh, in 1980, when I really came back to the Lord, I repented and, and changed my ways and really was seeking the Lord with all our hearts and going after the Lord. And uh, through a circumstance that happened through one of Glenna's brothers got filled with the Spirit and, you know, I come from a Southern Baptist background, so I didn't remember actually being taught against tongues. No one just ever talked about it, okay? It was not a, any of the gifts as far as that goes. And so when we saw that happen to him and such a change that occurred in his life, it, it caused us to begin to do a search. So we got three different books. I got one book on by Kenneth Hagen on the Holy Spirit. I got a book by uh, Bill, Billy Graham on the Holy Spirit, and I got one on John MacArthur on the Holy Spirit. John MacArthur was very negative, obviously. Billy Graham's kind of in the middle. Kenneth Hagen was that. So we sat down, and we'd read through it, and then we'd look up the Scriptures. And we'd read through it, and then we'd read, you know, check the Scriptures. And the more we did it, and we come to the conclusion, this is for today. There is nothing that talks about these gifts, gifts seizing. So the next thing became, well, well, what do I go somewhere to find someone who believes in this? And, you know, I have no clue. And uh, so we found this church at that time was, was uh, about the same time. It was South Kansas City Fellowship. And we began going there. And I can remember, I was really hungry for the Word of God, but I was also hungry for, for tongues because if tongues is real, then everything else is real. Healing is real. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom, gifted to so all those things would be real. So for me, it was really important. So I remember we went up on a, on a Tuesday night, they had a kind of altar call for people who want to be filled in the Spirit and receive their prayer language. So you know, we went forward, and, and there's a couple there, and they were praying for us. And, and you know, so, so I was there just, okay, really pressing in. And time went by. The, you know, the room kind of emptied out, started turning off the lights. And the people said, you yeah, know, well, maybe we ought to try this another time, you know. So, disappointed. But the very next day, I was out in, the, in, a, in my car. I, I would call on a lot of the areas in the Overland Park area. And so, on my lunch, I was sitting in the car praying. And then all of a sudden, I start speaking in tongues. And I was so pumped, you know. And and I think I already received the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit before that, but I'd never spoken in tongues. So back then, we didn't have cell phones. Okay, this is 1983. So I go find a payphone. It's this thing, you put coins in, you know, and you, you dial them, yeah. And um, uh, so I call Glenna, because I want to tell her. So she answers, and at that time, she was feeding our Clayton, our youngest son, uh, in a high chair, and she had received it the same time I did while she was feeding the baby, you know, and it was like, wow, that was just such a confirmation, uh, but yeah, because then that started us on a journey going, yes, it's all real, there is more, you know, all right, Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 12, now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. 
Now when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hear them in his own language, his own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, resident of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Pyphra, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Now, if you take all those nations, what you will find is that it starts from east and goes west. Okay? And each of those are part of that 70 original nations. So they're all there in Jerusalem on that day when the Spirit is poured out, and then they're going to be filled with the Spirit. They're going to be uh, the gospel preached to them. They're going to be saved, and they're going to take the gospel back with them to all these different nations where God has placed them. So God had seeded those people generations before. And now we're seeing the fulfillment and see things turn. All right, verse 13. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Okay, so that's usually two responses you kind of get. Anytime you're sharing the gospel, you get belief and you get unbelief. And even Paul says in Corinthians, he says, hey, the the natural man, he doesn't perceive it at all. I mean, it's like foolishness. You know, the the stuff about the gospel, about Jesus, or isn't again, all that stuff, it's just, that's way out there. And in this case, they were even mocking saying because of the way the Spirit had fallen and their actions and what was happening, that they were drunk. And Peter says, no, they're not drunk. They haven't even had the French roast yet. So, let's go on with verse 14 and 15. Then Peter stood up with eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem... Let me explain to you, listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Okay, so Peter's going to quote. Again, we think sometimes as, uh, you know, that, that Peter and those disciples were backward fishermen but how often they quote scriptures. They knew scripture. It was memorized, okay? It says, in the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
So in verses 17 through 18, that is the kingdom already. Okay? From there on, that is the kingdom not yet. So we live in this place of the kingdom already, but the kingdom is not yet. The fulfillment and the fullness of the kingdom has not come. So we live in this time zone, you might say, where we're living between these two eras. Because the kingdom has come, but it's not culminated yet. Verse 22 and 23 says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. And you yourself know this man was handed over to you by God, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So in that scripture, actually in verse 22 and 23, you see two different things. You see God's sovereignty, okay? Because he said, it was God's set purpose and foreknowledge for this to happen. Yet at the same time, he shows human responsibility for choices that were made. So you have on one hand, you have sovereignty of God. On the other hand, you have human responsibility. It's not one or the other. It was both in this case. It was God's plans but they are held guilty for what they did. Again, and then in verse 24, Paul wants, or Peter wants to emphasize, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In other words, he wants to emphasize the resurrection, that he is not in the grave, Yes, he was crucified, but he is alive, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Okay, in verses 25 through 28, this is where Peter is going to be quoting, again, from the Old Testament, Psalms 16, verses 8 through 11. And he says, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is in my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. So again, he's quoting Psalm 16. And then he's going on to explain, because this is the part where even Jesus had to correct some of their thinking to say, so he can explain to them, this passage isn't talking about David, it's talking about the Christ, Jesus. So verses 29 through 36, we'll read that. It says, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. 
exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he makes it clear. Okay, and again, he's holding them responsible. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? So the people were cut to the hearts. In other words, part, you know, if you go back to John, part of the description of the Holy Spirit is that it is also a spirit of conviction. He said, we'll convict people of sin. So they were cut to the heart. They knew they were guilty. So they asked, okay, shall what do we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So repent and be baptized. Now again, baptism does not save you. Baptism is only an ordinance that shows an outward witness of what has happened inwardly to us. And so they followed in baptism. As we go on, it says, With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the number that day. That's a pretty good harvest. 3,000 in your first message, huh? Yeah. Awesome. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So there's three things they devoted themselves to, to teaching, okay, teaching the Word of God, to fellowship, spending time together, fellowshipping, over many times over meals, over food, just being together, strengthening one another, and the third one, Prayer. And how important prayer is in that, in that triple issue there. And it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave as everyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. So when it says they had all things in common, that is not talking about communism, okay? Because some people have tried to make that, that connection. 
But these were people who willingly gave, some of them sold property, whatever they need to meet the needs of this very fast-growing congregation. 3,000, then every day people were being added to it. Now, sometimes in the past, there have been different groups, especially thinking back in the 70s, that felt they wanted to start communes and would have all things in common. They never work out, you know, because that's really not the biblical pattern as you go on. Each one, while we need to have that fellowship, we need to share things when the Lord is leading us. I think it's very important also for us to have our own property, our own places, our own homes. And then from that place of strength to bless others, to gather others to come in. And the Lord added to their numbers daily, breaking bread in their homes, they ate together. So it's that fellowship. And that's why one thing I think we need to begin to increase in this next season is home groups. Because so much happens in a home group that can't happen on a Sunday morning. Where people can exercise their gifts more. They're in fellowship with one another. They're uh, sharing life together. And if you go back, it says they were meeting daily, you know, in the temple courts. They were fellowshipping together. To be quite honest, in our fellowship, we have... 30% 30% come once a month, probably. 30% come every other month or every other week. And then probably 30% that come most Sundays unless, you know, they're on vacation or traveling. It's not make judgment. It's just a fact. But the fact is, when you have everyone together, there's a synergyism that happens, whether it's in worship or whether it's even sharing the word, whether it's praying together. There's a synergy that makes a difference. Sometimes we think, well, I don't need, but it's not about what you need. It's you bringing your part, you being here, you sharing life with others. So I think that's something we need to do in this next coming year is begin to expand home groups. And then ideally what would happen was those home groups would grow because it wouldn't just be who's in your home group, but you'd invite others. And then eventually those would split And you'd add other home groups, and it would just continue to grow. But there's things that can happen in in a home group that can't happen, again, like on a Sunday morning. There's just not time, uh, and it takes, uh, and it's also a safe place for people to practice their gifts, to grow, and to challenge each other. So that is something I want to see kind of in this next coming year for us to begin to expand that. It's a great way to have fellowship, because when you're just here on a Sunday morning, you might greet each other some in the morning or right after the service, but that's not a lot of fellowship. And we all need fellowship. We all need to grow. So again, we have that model of the book of Acts for what a New Testament church is to look like. And that's why we do what we do with team ministry. Again, trying to... uh, incorporate just that servant-hooded uh, heart for people, to be involved, to use their gifts, to share, to realize it's not about one person, a personality, you know, that we're not following, uh, because that can be dangerous. Because that person falls, that person gets off track, it can destroy churches. And so it's where we all are together. We all are doing our part. We're all using our gift. And again, as I've often said, you know, Christianity is not a spectator sport. We're all to be involved and be a part of it. So anyway, that's Acts chapter 2. It's my story. I'm sticking to it. But what you see is that this goes back a lot farther than just the prophets. It goes back to Genesis It goes back to what the Lord had in mind and his long-term plan of reclaiming the earth, of bringing all the nations. In fact, it says what's the last thing, that 
all the nations will have the kingdom of God preached. Then the end will come. And so we're in that process right now of where maybe probably 90 some percent have had the gospel preached. So we're getting closer to fulfilling that mandate. But it was always in the Lord's heart. It was always in Paul's heart to go to Spain, to go to that last, that furthest west at that time, to share the word, to share the message. And so we're in that place. We're in that place of living between the already that's happened and the not yet. And so we're in this place of tension sometimes. But I believe as we begin to go forward, we're going to see more and more of his presence. We're going to see the world get a lot darker. Yeah, it's going to be rough. It's going to be harder in one sense. But the power of God is going to be increased in our midst too. And what those experience, people experience there on the day of Pentecost, he wants to do again. You know, we're praying for revival for churches all across this nation. We're praying for a third great awakening to come to this nation that would turn this nation back to the Lord. But we need to be doing that. We need to be praying. We'll be interceding. It makes a difference. So, yes, it is going to be darker, challenging times, but the Lord is faithful, and he will hold us, and he will use each of us for his purposes. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word, that your word is so so deep, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you for the plans that you had from eternity past that we're seeing the outworking of that. And Lord, that you would let us be a part of what you're doing. That you use weak human vessels to accomplish your purposes. Just as you use those heavenly beings, those supernatural beings in heaven to accomplish your purposes. And yet you've also given us free will. We could choose to love you, to be obedient, or we can choose not to, Lord. Just as these angels, Lord, who had that free choice also, Lord, and some of them decided to rebel. But Lord, we thank you that you didn't make us robots. But your love has showed us the way. And Lord, we love you. And Lord, we long for more of you. We're hungry for more, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would pour out your spirit anew and afresh upon this nation, on churches all across this nation, that we would see a new day of Pentecost. Lord, we pray for a new Jesus movement. Lord, we pray for, just as you did in the first and second great awakening, we pray for a third great awakening to come to this nation. Despite how dark it is, Lord, that your light will, your light will shine brighter. So, Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. 11.30, I've done pretty good. Uh, but even though once prayer, we're going to have a little song at the end. We're going to have a little worship. Those of you who want prayer, feel free to come up. If you need prayer, don't hesitate. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of your healing. So we're going to take a few minutes. We'll be up here front to pray for you. And the rest of you, have a great day. Go Chiefs, huh? Amen. <laughs>